you see at the bottom okay, there's I see you. Okay, I see your profile pic. Yeah. Oh, my profile. Well, that's I'm actually on three different devices, by the way. Oh, so <laughs> okay. All right. Okay. <laughs> there's one video of me and two profile pics. All right. Okay, so Umu, everything good? Okay. Yeah, okay. All right, okay, thank you so much. Well, the recording has started. So um, welcome everybody to our UM Star series. This is where we chat with leaders and members of UM Top Management. And I am very, very happy today uh, because we're chatting with our very own Deputy Vice Chancellor of Academics and International, Professor Dr. Camila Ghazali. So before we start, just to let all of our UM academics know, this session is for you. Prof. Camila is here to speak to you. So if you have any questions to ask, any stories to share, um, good and bad, always share the good ones as well. We don't have enough of those, you know, there's a lot of good things happening, but people are just not sharing about that. Feel free to share on that and you can uh, type in the chat and I will try to read out as many as possible. So, uh, oh, let me introduce myself. My name is Amira Ferdows uh, from Academic Enhancement and Leadership Development Center of ADAC. So, thank you so much, Prof. Camila. Welcome to our UM Star Series. Prof, oh, did we lose Prof momentarily? This happens sometimes with the recording. Okay, there we go. We've got Prof back on. Thank you. <laughs> I'm sorry. I, I don't know what happened. <laughs> I think I'm just clicking around too many places. <laughs> happens to all of us. <laughs> okay, I, I'll just keep my hands to myself now. How are you, Prof? How are you I'm doing? Fine. I know we had a busy morning. Yeah, it's been like really you know from eight it had been like back to back you know and uh it's been non-stop tried to gobble up now never mind it's that's <laughs> i'm here now so i'm happy to be with you guys although i cannot see you guys you are like small little icons at the bottom of my screen i don't know why the rest <laughs> of like, you know it's just dark that's why i was like fiddling around trying to get uh people you know on on the you know to fill up more of the screen and i don't know why it's it's not appearing so anyway how how are you and you know i i'm not going to ask how is everybody because i think that's going to make it very hard for people to actually respond uh so i'm just asking how are you dr amira <laughs> Thank you, Prof. Uh, I am well. I am good. Uh, it's always exciting to be able to talk to you, Prof. Um, so I'm even happier right now. Yeah. We actually you sound very happy. You sound very up. You know, you, you you sound very excited, even more excited sounding than than I am. <laughs> and I always sound very excited. <laughs> okay, we'll have to compete, Prof. <laughs> oh, before before you begin, I'd like to wish. Uh, all those who celebrate uh, Chinese New Year, Happy Chinese New Year, Kongsi Kongsi. So, you know, I, I hope we're still in the uh, Chinese New Year mood, even though, you know, it's, it's, it's uh, you know, we have to develop a different kind of mood with the MCO. So I'm wearing red today, you know, to celebrate uh, Chinese New Year. So anyway. You can start now, yeah. huh? Tamira. Okay, Prof. Um, well, glad to know that we're celebrating in our little ways. I completely forget the days of the week. So, <laughs> but speaking of that topic, Prof. Um, you know, Prof. I don't know whether anyone realizes this, but today, the 18th of February, is almost exactly one. Sorry, almost exactly 11 months since Malaysia went um, into COVID-19 MCO series i think that's a good way to call it that's right that's right yes i i i received a uh, you know pop up in my memories uh on facebook um on the first of february when we had posted the uh the the buntings the floor buntings on the and the posters on covid 19. at that time we didn't call it covid 19 at that time we called it the new coronavirus you remember right so, yeah. yeah so we we what well, at that time when it started um you know i was working together with um 
Encik Hirman, uh, at HEP at that time, of course, with CCO and, you know, everybody else who was like, all flustered and you know trying to put together things the sops and and all that yeah so that was that was actually the first of february and uh, people i was uh bucking in instructions to <laughs> that didn't really quite enjoy the holiday you know the hari wilaya <laughs> holiday you know so yeah yeah so so from the first day of the mco yeah it's it's um uh, 11 months now 11 months and it's a, a lot that we have done in UM, a lot that we've done actually under your portfolio, Prof, academic and yeah. international. Right. Um, maybe we can start, Prof, what's your most memorable, what do you think is UM's most memorable achievement throughout this last 11 months of doing online teaching? I should ask you if you remember what the values are that, uh, our Datuk Vice Chancellor Prof Hamdi had presented uh, during the Prutusan. Do you know what our new core values are? I remember that it's poise. Yeah, yeah, it's poise. So <laughs> the O in poise is really what we uh, actually had demonstrated as a university. There is oneness, and basically we were all. Uh, together in facing the pandemic and what we had to go through in preparing for the teaching and learning especially. Uh, of course, uh, uh, HEP was very, very, um, you know, on top of the game as well because they had to prepare the SOP for the students and it was something which uh, not only University Malaya had to be challenged with but of course it was a global pandemic and we were reading about how other people were uh, handling it and, and so on. So uh, the oneness that I really, really felt from all quarters of the university was uh, really reflected during during the start of the pandemic and how we had uh, handled it in the beginning and throughout, seriously. We were very passionate, the P in points, uh, you know, in wanting to ensure that everything was in order and our, our students and our staff and our, uh, were, were protected and we wanted to make sure that uh, we had the proper uh, guides and the standard operating procedures in place so that people will not, uh, you know, will be too anxious and, and uh, people will not panic. So, uh, the the one thing that I, I felt mostly was the oneness and the solidarity and the way we had come together and how we had worked together to ensure that, you know, we handled things in uh, as best we can, you know. So that that's, I hope that answers your question. That, that was really what I felt about how we went through it the first time. Actually, Prof, I was thinking there might, you know, one specific um, achievement or one specific item. But when you say that it is oneness and when you look at it as being togetherness together as a UM community, facing this completely new way of working, new way of teaching, new way of doing work, um, I guess that kind of like sums it up. That is a pretty big achievement. It is, it is. Because because uh, if, you, if you want to ask me about a specific uh, achievement, it was really in how we had put together the the e-learning you know the online learning and how we had expanded it and we would not have been able to do it i would not have been able to do it without uh of course without adac without uh qmac and um you know asp center and asc ptm everybody you know who had played a very very big role in ensuring that you know the e-learning platform for one and also how to go about doing things and and uh, you know how people had uh, kind of like rushed <laughs> to get the training in order to be able to conduct the online classes uh, properly at that time we didn't we didn't I, I mean I just I just realized it now when I'm I, I'm speaking here that we uh, that we actually uh, started using online learning more so than e-learning we used to say e-learning all the time, but somehow now everybody is using online learning. Uh, but yeah, because uh, we started with the initiative of e-learning um, 
many years back, right? And uh, even though we took counts, even though we had asked faculties to do it, I know, you know, realistically, people were not really doing it full on, you know, but then when um, the pandemic came and everybody was in a great big hurry to get themselves trained and upskilled on how to do it right, um, and then how, you know, uh, people had, well, the, the, the PTJs I mentioned just now had come together to produce the uh, guidelines and the handbook on how to uh, conduct uh, e-learning, uh, online learning, as well as the assessments. Uh, I, I thought that was, you know, one of the achievements to actually get us going. And then, of course, we had put together some, uh, you know, proposals to the Senate and Senate had passed and we did. I, I feel that the achievement that we had made in the early days was how quickly and I again, I go back to how strong we were as a team in putting things together very, very quickly so that we could actually, uh, you know, make sure that classes went on. And that was, you know, the start. If you remember, I remember, like, I, I will like, forever remember this date on the 27th of April because we were really, really rushing uh, to ensure that everything was in order in time for the students to, you know, uh, get going with the with the opening up of the semester again, even though they were from home. No. Yeah, that was um, that first time, I think, was quite, you know, a lot of questions were people had a lot of questions, yes. not sure what to do. <laughs> yes, yes, yes. You. you know, and and uh, I think because the people who were asking were mostly um, the academics. So I, I think EDEC was uh, bombarded with a lot of like how to, why, when and, and so on. You know, so I, I know that that had gone on. Yeah. Well, it was actually very helpful, Prof, when your office, uh, I think, commissioned the UM Online Teaching and Learning Guide. Um, and after we got that out, I think perhaps that helped to answer some questions. Um, yeah. For those of you who might be wondering um, or who have not yet seen the UM Online Teaching and Learning Guide, it's available both on the um, DVC Academic and International website as well as the ADEC website. And perhaps I can also request Linda or Umu if you could kindly care the link, uh, share the link um, in the chat uh, in case anybody happens to be, you know, wanting to look for it right now. But you don't want to go and change your screen because you want to stay on the same screen here. <laughs> you don't want to go to a different screen to look for it right now. Um, you know, Prof, uh, we're talking now about, I guess, online teaching and learning, and this is something that we had done from the beginning. It was actually done for the students because we wanted to ensure that UM students, academics were, you know, obviously it was disrupted. We cannot run away from the fact, but that we tried to actually make sure that the disruption is as minimal as humanly possible at that moment. Prof, can you share a little bit about the supports um, that UM shared and tried to do for the students with the online learning? Um, okay, um, I think everyone uh, knows about this. We we had initiated this uh, um, data plan with Cellcom. Uh, you know, so we were able to support up to 2,000 students who actually had um, submitted uh, yeah, well, we, we did a survey, right? So um, I think for those of you who um, are aware, you know, we actually had supported the students through a data plan, uh, through the UM Cellcom um, data plan uh, for a year. Um, but then um, that that actually enabled them to uh, get the lessons online for those of the students who didn't have strong internet um, you know accessibility in their hometowns because uh, at one time uh, some students were still on campus until the time when everybody had to go back so you know um, so those of those students who knew that 
they didn't have internet accessibility. They stayed on on campus, but then once they uh, had to go back, we also had to top up on you know those students who had to go back. So uh, that was the kind of support that we had provided our students. And um, uh, apart from that, uh, I think people also know about the uh, UM Prihatin. You know, there was a lot of uh, support given in terms of accommodation, which we didn't we didn't actually charge for during that time. Uh, students who were stranded on campus were, you know, given food, and uh, yeah, and and uh, there were even people who came in and wanted to, you know. Um, um, on top of the food that was already provided, I think in the early days people actually went to uh, people actually came out and uh, wanted to provide more food packages for the students. You know, but then again, Dr. Amira, that was like all new stuff. You know, that's something everybody already knew. <laughs> everybody knows about all that already. So, so that's in your past. You know, so now let's we... talk about new news. Yeah, <laughs> yeah. yeah. So new news, new news, you know, we, we have a lot of new initiatives because, uh, well, um, since we are all very comfortable already teaching online, so um, the Vice Chancellor talked about how we are going to go into uh, open and distance learning. Uh, on top of that, uh, remote learning. So those are two new things that we are pursuing. We did try to pursue before uh, the ODL, the Open Distance Learning, but then we know that we uh, were kind of hampered because um, at that time, people didn't really quite get what that was all about. And then uh, MQA came up with the uh, guidelines and procedures and, and all that. So, so um, now is a good time as any to be able to pick that up again. Um, the other that we are pursuing is remote learning. Now, this is something that is uh, new yet not new. Uh, new because we are calling it remote learning. Uh, not new because we are doing it already anyway. Because, uh, you know, through the online learning that we have been, um, you know, doing this past year, people are very comfortable with it. People are already very savvy in the uh, teaching delivery and the methodology and the pedagogy that goes into it, uh, alternative assessments that go into it. So where I can I can very confidently say um, most of the academics are already very, very comfortable with uh, online uh, teaching and learning. Uh, we don't necessarily enjoy it 100 percent we still want our students back on campus i know but some people actually do enjoy and have you know discovered that hey this is something that i can actually do you know um something which you know is not so overwhelming after all so because of the you know the the way we are feeling and the way we are functioning now um Remote learning is just the next step forward. So we would like, you know, to be able to offer our programs through remote learning, which means that uh, the students that we have will not just be the students uh, who come through the, you know, UPU and uh, the postgraduate students may not necessarily be just the ones that are on campus and have, you know, free access on to come to campus and attend classes on campus, but we will have another category of students who will be learning remotely, which means that they will be, you know, elsewhere, maybe in their own home countries, maybe in the kampong, maybe, you know, um, uh, somewhere outside of Kuala Lumpur, and they will still be able to follow our classes online, you know. So that's remote learning. That's that's a new avenue of getting a degree from University Malaya. So that's something new that we are going to pursue, and that is something that we are going to, uh, you know, um, that's an avenue that we're going to offer in the next academic session. Some um, some faculties and some programs are already ready, or rather, you know, they they will be preparing for uh, open distance learning. So that's 
again another avenue where we will be able to offer our programs you know to yet yeah, a different category of uh, uh, students or uh, uh, candidates you see we are a university that is the flag bearer of the nation we know that um, we can only accept a certain number of students every year we can only accept a, a, a certain number of uh, students on campus every year because of the capacity because of the infrastructure because of you know the physical uh, capacity that we have on campus and in the classrooms and all that but then at the same time there are so many 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 more students out there who would really love to be a part of our university so uh, you know in order to be able to offer this um, opportunity uh, to more people out there to get um, you know um, higher education from university of malaya we will that's that's why we are doing this you know we will be able to offer to more students yeah to to get access to the programs that we offer so remote learning that's one way uh odl that's another way so that's that's something that uh you know we're all excited about offering in this coming academic session prof can we if we were to just go through a little bit of a nitty-gritty of it can um what would be the difference then between remote learning and um the term that we've been using for many many years odl open distance learning in terms of how um is actually going to present both two separate programs okay um well remote learning you you can call it e-learning you can call it online learning you can call it remote learning it's the same you know basically uh, what we have been doing this past year that is, you know, offering, a, I mean, teaching our students online, that's exactly what it is. So we're calling it remote learning is uh, uh, because they will not come to campus at all. You know, um, even when we have our students back on campus and we are, you know, conducting our courses face to face, when so conducting our classes face to face, these students will still be uh, accessing our lessons online yeah uh, so we may actually be conducting our our class in a hybrid way we will have our students in front of us at the same time we will have a camera that will be on us while we're teaching our students physically face to face there will be another group of students who will be accessing what we are teaching concurrently okay so that's remote learning because the students will be remotely well, they'll be accessing our uh, lessons remotely. Okay, now open and distance learning uh, means that um, the student, we, we will be preparing our lessons, uh, um, you know, our lessons will be called self-instructional materials. Okay, so which means that, um, the students may not necessarily join us in class, you know, but they will, but maybe it's at the same time, maybe it's at a different time, but at the, but at the same time, the materials that we are providing them is basically self-instructional. You know, they will be able to do a lot of uh, um, self-directed learning because you know when they get the package when they read uh, the materials that uh, we provide for them it's not just a matter of the powerpoint presentations that we usually prepare it's not just you know um, it's not just the the lecture materials but also uh, going deeper into you know um, we will be thinking ahead of okay uh, which parts of this uh, would the student not understand and prepare for that ahead of time, you know, in anticipation of us not being in front of them that they cannot ask us directly. You know what I mean? Yeah, so that's the, the self-instructional materials. Also, we must make sure that our materials are, uh, are original, which means that we cannot just simply download, you know, a YouTube 
video. We cannot just simply use uh, somebody else's uh, PowerPoint that we may be able to get freely online. You know, so we must make sure that we prepare our own uh, PowerPoint materials. We must make sure that we prepare our own materials. You know, to for for that category of students. Plus, uh, the lessons with the open and distance open and distance uh, learning students uh, will have to be at least 60% uh, online. So it can be 80% online, you know, and uh, there may be some amount of face-to-face, -face, but then basically it is uh, in that way. Yeah, so they're not, they're not, um, they're not the same as the remote uh, learners because the remote learners will be um, taking the classes together with the rest of our students who are on campus. Okay, so um, let me see whether I got this right to summarize. Yeah. Okay. <laughs> we have our regular programs, our Bachelor of uh, or Masters of whatever that we're offering now. And those we're offering, of course, um, traditionally it was physical, but now for the past year, it's been mainly online. So that will be those programs that will be running remote learning because we'll have both on campus as well as remote students. Yes, okay, so I got that right, yay. Yep. yay. <laughs> and we will also be having open online or ODL uh, distance learning programs, which would be a different category of programs where the faculties would then develop new programs to be offered fully via open distance learning. Okay, not new programs. I, say I got that wrong. Okay. No, not new programs, existing programs. Existing programs? Right. It's just that the mode of delivery is uh, on open and distance learning uh, mode, but the programs are already in existence. So we're not reinventing the wheel then? No. We're just... No, but we can, if people would like to offer a completely new program, you know, um, through, through ODL, it's fine. It's just that they will just have to come up with a new set of documentation as how we would prepare for new programs. Uh, the, the thing about offering the existing programs that we have, there will be less documentation required. Much, much less. I think that'll make a lot of people happy. Yes, and also, um, yeah, because uh, that will make, I hope it will make a lot of people happy and then, you know, come forward with more programs because, uh, uh, because of the objectives that we have in mind, yeah. Oh. Um, Prof, we're going into these sort of like new normal, new ways of offering our academic programs. Why are we doing this now? <laughs> For income generation is one. Okay, one of the big uh, the the big uh, reasons. One of the main reasons is also you know for income generation. All right, because uh, we, um, as you heard from uh, the vice chancellor during the Protusan, you know, he showed us the, you know, the situation, the financial situation of the university. Uh, we need to do this if we are going to remain sustainable. Uh, so there are other initiatives, of course, you yeah, know, for income generation, but this is just a couple of them where we can actually be. Um, that we can be actively involved in in supporting the university and uh, you know it's it's not going to be something that is um, completely new or for us to really really go out of our way in you know uh, pitching for business or you know pitching for for programs and endowment and all that yes we still have to do that but then at least you know this is what we do. This is what we do best. You know, um, education is our business. You know, so you know we have some of the best uh, people in the university. We have so much to offer. So we think that uh, you know we should think of ways how we might be able to offer to more people out there. So more people might be able to benefit from University of Malaya. At the same time. Uh, uh, make make uh, some income out of it, you know, and and help 
us to to be more sustainable. Yeah, and some of that income would actually go to paying for some salaries as yeah. well as upkeep. Yeah. yeah. So the idea is uh, for the income to go back to the faculty. You know, a larger portion, um, sixty percent is supposed to go back to the faculty, and uh, you know, out of that sixty percent, forty percent is supposed to go to. No, not not out of the sixty percent. Sixty percent is supposed to go to the faculty, and uh, you know, forty percent should be for the department, and twenty percent for the for the faculty. So basically, that's that's how it's going to work out. Prof, when we're talking about getting this, you know, um, to actually work out, uh, just wondering um, what might be the impact on lecturers' workload with these new kinds of programs that we have? Right. Uh, we have um, only just uh, finished um, presenting to the deans the KPI for this year. And this is something that I'll be talking about more, um, you know, in uh, town hall. And uh, we are just finalizing some things, and this will be rolled out next next week. Yeah. And uh, in terms of, okay, I I didn't mention just now, faculties that uh, will be offering uh, remote learning and um, ODL for this coming session will be, you know, incentivized first. You know because we know that some faculties might um, actually need the, um, you know, some some financial help to prepare the infrastructure. So every, uh, for every program that the faculty, uh, that the faculty uh, offers will be given 20,000 ringgit. You know, so if a faculty puts forward, you know, I'm going to be offering such and such program through uh, remote learning or ODL, that's 20K into the faculty already. You know, the more programs you offer, the more we will be providing. Uh, so that is to help the faculty uh, start things up. In terms of the workload, uh, well, there'll be the teaching and learning, uh, sorry, there'll be the teaching burden that you have to carry. So if you are teaching um, a, a course on uh, remote or if you're teaching a course on ODL, there'll be extra points given to you, you know, for for um, for, for getting on board to teach on the course in that in that um, you know um, in that mode. Uh, of course, the load is also part of your teaching workload. Yeah, say if you are teaching nine uh, nine teaching, you know, um, contact per week, then, you know, uh, the, the, that one class that you are teaching through remote or one class that you're teaching mm. through um, ODL, that's going to carry as part of your teaching, teaching burden. Yeah. Mm. And then uh, at the same time, uh, through the, through the uh, income that the faculty makes or the department makes, it's really up to the faculty and it's really up to the faculty how you might want to use the the income you yeah, know maybe it will work as a tabung for research i don't know and you know and then maybe those people who actually contribute in the program can be incentivized further or, or rewarded further by uh, you know getting some kind of uh, research funds or something so it's really how the faculty wants to arrange that so we're just providing the the goodies and it's up to you how you want to you know organize it okay thanks prof for that uh, before we move uh, on there's a couple of questions in the chat so i'll just read them out um the first one is asking must the remote learning start with a first year course for example first year person or is it going to be open at all levels simultaneously all right so it's going to be uh offered to a completely new set of students so these students will be kind of like our private students yeah so they will be applying because when once we advertise and and according to my plan we will start advertising for this next month so by march we should be you know <clears throat> rolling out the advertisements for the programs that we'll be offering so um 
we will have um, the saluran terbuka, right? So the saluran terbuka or the salur saluran terbuka University Malaya. So that is the satu program. And currently that's only undergraduate, okay? Those students will be joining our Perdana students. Uh, the satu program is only for, in, for Malaysians. It's only for local students. So the satu program will be one category of our private students who will be joining the rest of our students on campus in the class and you know following everything else that uh, that our um, you know Perdana students uh, will be following. And then uh, there'll be the other categories that the students when they apply they will be able to choose uh, whether they want to join through the Saluran Terbuka UM. They can ch also choose to uh, apply for the remote learning program or they can choose to apply for the ODL program. Okay, so there'll be three different uh, avenues. There'll be three different private avenues that they will be coming in to University of Malaya. Remote learning as well as ODL students will be open also to international students. And uh, we are opening up both undergraduate as well as uh, masters uh, by coursework and mixed mode uh, to uh, remote as well as ODL. Okay, so this will be like a new batch of students with, um, you know, um, new students. So they will have to come in as first SAM first year students. That's to answer that question. Prof, uh, can, for those students that are, who have entered through the remote learning, I guess, um, pathway, if they wanted to change and then become a regular residential on-campus student, would that be possible? And would it be possible vice versa as well? Uh, for the students who are uh, on the remote learning uh, pathway, they can, the plan is, because we haven't started, right? So I, I can only talk about the plan. So the plan is that they can apply to come in uh, and carry on the following semester or the following two semesters, uh, you know, and so on, um, to be a part of, you know, the, the, the rest of the students on campus. But it will be a different set of fees. That's the plan. Uh, and also it will be based on application and capacity. So it will be dependent on the faculty and the uh, jabatan if uh, they are able to accommodate. So the answer might be no, you know, but then again, you know, the, you don't apply, you don't know. Maybe you, maybe the answer is yes. Does it hurt to try, right? Yeah. yeah. Okay. Um, okay, Prof, there's another question, which I think is basically a philosophical question about this plan for hybrid learning. The question is, uh, Prof, do you think hybrid learning is the most realistic way forward, even beyond, um, inshallah, when the pandemic is over? Yes, yes, and yes. Do I have to elaborate? <laughs> <laughs> yes, I think it's realistic because like I said in the beginning, people are already comfortable teaching online. You know, some people actually prefer it. Uh, but at the same time, we know that, uh, you know, students want to be in class. They want to be with us. They want to be with other students. So, you know, uh, I think there should be um, I think it should carry on, uh, we should carry on with online, but at the same time, we should also as much as possible make it hybrid so that the students will have uh, the opportunity to also be with other students. We are social animals after all, so part of the learning process for, you know, the young, you know, the youth is actually uh, to understand how it is to socialize, to understand social etiquette and to, um, you know, to be able to be among society and to behave and, uh, you know, act in a social, socially acceptable way. Isn't, isn't that how it should be, you know? Uh, so yes, I think uh, we have to eventually have our students on campus, but at the same time, because we, uh, you know, it's a very practical way and it may be a necessary way to also uh, carry on with um, at least some of our lessons online. 
So yes, I would really want to encourage uh, everybody to carry on online, but you know, um, maybe not 100%, but make it hybrid, yes. Well, with regards to the uh, hybrid program, when we actually have uh, some courses that may require physical attendance, there is a question here. Most SNT science and technology courses rely on some lab skills. Will remote learners be invited in the final year to participate in projects, etc., to gain such skills? And if so, will the courses need to be reformatted, meaning that they cannot be exactly the same for um, remote learners? Right. Um, yeah, thanks for that question. Uh, at the moment, we are leaving out uh, <clears throat> uh, programs which, um, you know, um, you know, have professional accreditations because it will be very hard for, you know, the um, undergraduate programs in <clears throat> the engineering field or, um, you know, the undergraduate program for accounting, for example, you know, to be offering this through remote learning uh, or even ODL. So those uh, programs will automatically be, be left out. Uh, but for the for the programs that require lab sessions, I think the faculty will really have to plan to see if it is possible because really it depends on capacity. It really depends on the infrastructure that you have that you will be able to also include the remote learners in uh, the lab sessions. Uh, also, we will have to look at uh, numbers, yeah? Maybe the numbers will not be uh, as large. Uh, the numbers may, may not be like so large for, for those kinds of programs that we will still be able to cope when, when the time comes. But again, uh, uh, we will also have to work out, you know, for those programs, um, there will be uh, the fees involved, yeah? Because there will be another set of fees for remote learners. Uh, and as I mentioned just now, if they are, you know, coming onto campus, there's a, a whole different uh, scheme that we will have to talk about. That we just will have to talk about. Yeah, sorry. Uh, sorry, Prof. Uh, just to reconfirm, this different set of fees for the remote learners, those would be higher fees. Yep, higher higher than the Padana fees. Lah. Because you know that our uh, Padana fees, the, the UPU, the students who come in through uh, UPU pay only what um, 5 to 10% of the actual full cost of the fees. So our Saluran Terbuka uh, I was had to, you know, students who pay the private amount. And the the plan is that for remote learners, for the remote students, uh, will pay slightly less than the Satu students because they'll be remote. Mm, okay, so mm. basically it's a yeah. it's a Satu but a remote kind of uh, arrangement. Yeah. It's a private and yet it's a remote and uh, non non physical uh, arrangement. But uh, the fees have not really been worked out yet, and that's that's coming that's coming uh, quite soon because we are going to advertise next month. Prof, uh, basically, as you mentioned just now, the whole idea of having remote learning and, of course, the SATU program as well is to increase the number of students that we can actually bring into um, the UM academic programs. And I think that raises some questions about the um, quality of students. Uh, would the students coming in through the remote program and those existing ones through SATU be of lesser caliber than our Perdana students? No, uh, because we have already experienced uh, the, um, the cohort of the SATU students, right? Because uh, when we set you know, the requirements, it's the requirements that all students will have to fulfill. They will all have to fulfill the requirements as we have set uh, for you know all our students uh, you know uh, as 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 we are currently practicing. So even the remote <coughs> learners will have to fulfill all the uh, requirements in that way. And um, we actually do get um, you know with with competition we want to choose the best. 
So when we uh, opened up our Satu program, you know, even though um, the ones who apply, uh, the ones who apply meet our requirements, we get to choose the best students, right? Because that's like big numbers, so we get to choose. So, so they will. I imagine that. Well, this is new, so I can only speak of what I imagine it's going to be. I imagine that uh, you know we will still have a choice, even though you know the criteria is set. Everybody has to meet the criteria, but of course we would, you know, when the criteria is set, we ensure that those only of quality will come in, right? That's how the criteria is set. You know, so they have to meet that level. And because I think we may be getting like a, you know, white pool of uh, applications, then we also get to choose the best. For now, Prof, do you have any indication or inkling these uh, new applications for remote and ODL students, um, where they might be coming from based on the no. market research? <laughs> no, <laughs> no, I'm sorry. I don't, I don't have, you know, that kind of deep dive kind of. Uh, <laughs> um, but I know that we will be targeting for the ODL, we will be targeting um, adult learners, you know, uh, because uh, the APL will also be coming in as part of our um, entrance, uh, you know, uh, admissions requirement because as it is now, we also already take APL, you know, people with experience. So um, I imagine the ones who will be our target market for the ODL will be, um, will be adult learners. And then uh, for the remote learners, uh, they have to be able to follow the the classes concurrently with our classes that you know are being conducted uh, you know as as the normal semester goes they may not necessarily be adult learners they may not necessarily be people who are you know uh, working adults but they may be like the uh, satu students they didn't make it through the you know uh, UPU um process and they may be international students who may want to just stay put wherever they are mm -hmm. mm. yes especially in the current day of um, uncertainty yeah, yeah yeah prof you mentioned you mentioned just now the uh accreditation of prior um experiential learning apel would you like to elaborate a little bit about <laughs> apel for those who may not be familiar with it well, we have uh, so many different categories of the APL. Uh, APL, um, yeah, APL. Um, well, I I don't know if I want to get into it too, uh, you know, too too much in in the technical sense. You know, QMAC would be the best people to be talking about this, really. You know, because there are different categories of APL in 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 the sense that they can come in through not necessarily the normal uh you know criteria that we expect uh from stpm a levels and you know asasi matriculation or diploma those would be the normal you know um, the normal kind of uh expectations the apa will actually take care of those students who actually uh, may not have the paper qualification but there are different again I better qualify myself because I'm not going to go into the technicalities of the different categories of APEL. But then because uh, we are, you know, the government wants more and more people to be pursuing higher degrees. So, you know, it is really to cater to those people who may not necessarily have the paper qualification, but they have tons of industry um, experience. So that's just one category, you know. So I'm I'm not going to go into detail. Yeah. Okay. Mm. But that's great, Prof. Uh, you've at least clarified to people who may not have heard of APEL, so that yeah. uh, we all know now. Very easily Google to you can very easily find it. Okay, thank you, Prava. That would definitely be very um useful for some programs, I think. Um, yeah. not, Prav, all, yeah. not all, not all, not not all programs. Uh have that as an entry uh, requirement. Mm, okay. Mm. Uh, okay, Prof, we've talked a bit, uh, quite a bit actually, about um, 
online, that's a word now, online teaching and learning and our plans moving forward with the remote learning ODL um, plans. Uh, let's move to talk about internationalization, which is something I think uh, maybe we don't get as much, um, to, you know, as much opportunity to talk about it uh, yeah. as we would like. Prof, can you share a little bit about um, how the pandemic in, you know, impacted internationalization um, in UM and what are your plans moving forward? Okay, um, thanks for bringing that up because that was one of the challenges that we had faced uh, last year when um, our students who had been identified to go abroad for the study abroad program and, uh, you know, students from abroad who wanted to come and join us, you know, many, many, many students were very, very disappointed because they had, you know, very uh, exciting uh, programs and activities to look forward to and then, you know, uh, they couldn't go. So that was that was a real uh, downer for us and, you know, the one of the big challenges that we had to face. Um, so there was a very quick uptake from our uh, International Student Centre as well as our colleagues from the faculties who uh, figured out ways on how we might be able to still give our students the international exposure that, you know, um, that we want them to get. Um, to me, um, internationalization for, for me personally, really is for our Malaysian students to be exposed to uh, other cultures, other, you know, um, perspectives, other points of view. So when we have uh, international staff on campus, where we have uh, international students on campus, I, I really, really, um, you know, um, think that it's a really good opportunity for our students to mingle with them, to, you know, ask them questions about their, their, their cultures, their homes, their way of life and the way they think. Really, it is uh, something that I feel our students should take advantage of. So internationalization for our students is that for me, you know. Of course, we want to open up our doors to uh, international students from abroad to come and join us, you know. Again, that is also, you know, once they join us, they are our students. So we are, we're not like, you know, uh, um, categorizing them in that way or anything like that. But, but the point I'm trying to get at is the integration is very, very important you know, for our students to be with people who are non-Malaysians. As it is, yeah, fine, we are, you know, a multi-ethnic uh, society and that in itself is already advantageous to us. But then at the same time, when we expose our students to other nationalities and, you know, uh, see how other people think, you know, that's, that's really, really very, very um, advantageous. Um, so I was, uh, I mentioned just now, uh, with the good work of the International Student Centre and also our faculty uh, colleagues who found ways and means to still carry on with international activities online and that's what they did. Uh, they conducted activities which um, were held, you know, not in webinars but not just in webinars but also in you know, uh, exchanging of shows, exchanging of um, um, dances and and um, activities that they could actually organize, and all this uh, was done online. And um, I think rather than zero, we actually got somewhere. We actually got somewhere in you know to ensure that at least they get to communicate and see each other online. And I have attended and I have picked through some of these activities and and people are very, very appreciative because the whole world is going through the pandemic. Everybody is online anyway, you know. Uh, talking to your sister, talking to your brother is also like done online, you know. So when, when you have these activities uh, and people actually 
<laughs> you know, manage to exchange a version of you know their their own cultures online. That was still that was still done. That was still possible. You know, and it was still appreciated. So that was that was a really good thing uh, that we managed to do that. And um, we still count that as mobility. <laughs> we still count that as you know inbound and outbound mobility. <clears throat> and then the other thing that we managed to do was uh, to hold uh, conferences online. We managed to hold and host so many webinars online and people actually you know just came in and out of conferences just came in and out of webinars and and uh and speaking engagements online like you know it 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 just got easier and easier you know and suddenly people were saying like wow i you know, managed to present a paper online without having to go through the airport and <laughs> wait hours on end for the flight to be over. And, you know, so suddenly meetings were possible, you know, and uh, we we were having our meetings with our international partners and, look, it's, you know, how come we didn't do this earlier? You know, how come we didn't do this more often before? You know, we had our you know, Skype meetings off and on. Yeah, but then, you know, not, not as often as we are doing now. So the world has become smaller and smaller uh, through this experience and people still carry on, you know. Um, you might also know that uh, we have transformed our marketing, you know, strategy and we are very active conducting our uh, marketing virtually we have our uh, uh, what do they call it uh, virt virtual marketing platforms you know MRC is like constantly inviting uh, um, you know our colleagues to come and participate at the booths because booths you know because these are virtual booths mm -hmm. and you know people have become so organized and and clever in how they uh, now functioning, you know, all kinds of things online. It is a challenge because it's still not the same. It's still not the same. I would still like to shake uh, my international partner's hand. <laughs> I would still like to bring them out for dinner or lunch, you know. Uh, but then it's it's you know it's still it's still workable. It's still possible. Prof, I think that's the one thing that a lot of people miss, that actual physical connectivity and and, yeah. and, and traveling, being in an actual place and experiencing the place. Yeah. But Prof, would you say compared to previous years, would you say that the past year may have actually increased the numbers of internalization activities that we've had? I I don't know because I don't I don't know if um uh, well, I'm sure we have the statistics. I'm sure we have the data, but I don't know if uh, we 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 can say that uh, there had been more. Uh, but then I feel as if we are forever, you know, uh, online with colleagues from abroad. You know, whether it's a formal uh, webinar session or whether it is just you know a meeting online. You know, and. Uh, yeah, it seems to be going on quite often. It, it seems to be going on like quite, quite, because you, you get these emails, right? You get these emails and you get these pop-ups on all the social media that you're on and, you know, something is going on all the time. Oh, one more thing I wanted to say. We also incorporated last year, we also incorporated uh, into, it was a last minute in, incorporation of the KPI because we had to like change about things at the last minute because uh, there were some things that was not uh, achievable uh, by the PTJs because of the pandemic. So to be fair, we had to like move things about. So one of the things that we um, managed to do last year was to incorporate having international uh, colleagues come into our classroom to teach our students in the in the course. You know, so uh, online. I mean. You know, so that was actually incorporated in the KPI for last year, you know, to to at least increase the engagement that we have with our international partners. 
um, when I did that, um, it was with the with with the intention of addressing internationalization. But then at the same time, you know, after that, on hindsight now, I didn't actually need to do that because people were doing it, you know, on, in so many different ways. But then what I had wanted to do was to get uh, an international partner to come into our uh, course, to come into our class and teach our students online. So instead of having a visiting professor come all the way from Australia or, or Thailand or, you know, wherever they come from, you know, we could just like have our students listen to the lecture online, you know, by our colleague from, from Japan, you know, and uh, that's, that's exposure as well you know, for our students. Does it work the other way around as well, Pro, for our yeah. lecturers to go and give lectures online to overseas students? Right. Yes, of course. But, you know, the, the thing is, um, I know that people were doing it anyway. You know, just like how we have our industrial uh, practitioners, you know, come to our faculty to, to give lectures, people were doing it anyway. It's just that what what um, I had attempted to do was to to structure it to make sure that you know it's part of the course you know so it can be properly planned and and incorporated and that's another that's another thing that we're doing uh, it's called the elite program it's called the elite at UM uh, program um, where we have that that's a longer <laughs> that's a longer it's an acronym for a longer thing. Uh, let me try to recall. Uh, experiential learning by industrial technopreneurs, something. So it's easy, you know. So basically, we we want the our the industry to come into our classroom, uh, not just to give a talk generally to you know uh, whoever uh, who can attend. We want them to come into our classroom as part of our schedule, as part of our teaching, uh, you know, uh, plan for the 14 weeks. They don't have to come for 14 weeks. They can come for one of the courses. Uh, they can come for one of the lectures only. It's just that it's structured in uh, the course in the same way that I mentioned our international partners do. And the benefit of this, um, as you mentioned earlier on, is that once these kinds of engagements, international engagements are formalized, even though we've been doing it for a long time, but once it's formalized, that means that UM lecturers and also the faculties can actually get, I guess, points for it. That would be the ah, language okay. to use now, right? Right, to get points for it, yes. Because <laughs> people are, you know, if, if we want to think of, uh, okay, um, what do I get out of it? The reward is that, you know, it's part of your KPI. But, you know, if you think of it in terms of how it's going to benefit the students, you know, like I said, a whole new world is being open to them. And uh, for for the industry practitioners to come into the classroom, you know, they might be able to see themselves in them, you know, and, and say like, you know, in 10 years, in 15 years, you know, I will be that person, or even five years, I will be that person, you know, because we we hope that we will be able to get um, the industry practitioners who are really quite successful in their work, so they will be able to impart to our students on, you know, where their degree is going to take them, what their specialization is, where what their spe specialization will allow them to do you know so that's that's a kind of um, motivation we would like to give our students and it would be good now that it's actually more and more convenient for people um to be less chances of people turning us down simply because it's inconvenient to come all the way yeah um, right yeah um, yeah yeah you, um, you're thinking of that i think many people are thinking of that as well we can actually have have it online but i really hope that we will be able to get out of this quite soon so that you know they can actually see the person and you know not physically and not just online yeah nothing quite 
quite deep to that. Um, yeah. Prof, uh, we have a thank you to a Prof or Dr. Ho Yong Kang, who's actually shared the acronym for ELITE at UM, Experiential Learning with Industry oh. and Technology <laughs> UM. <laughs> thank you. <laughs> So that's a great about webinars as compared to um, you know, a physical thing because probably nobody would just interrupt the discussion to say, oh, this is the acronym's full name, but then with a webinar, you can just type it and share it in the chat. Uh -huh. <laughs> okay. Prof, if we can jump back uh, for a little while to online teaching and learning, uh, I'm just gonna read off a couple of comments here. There is one comment here saying that physical presence now becomes an option and students now have the choice whether or not to join a physical class and that will really increase the value of a particular physical class presence compared to when physical classes are compulsory. <laughs> Would you have any comments on that, Prof? No. <laughs> can, I, can I have that choice or say no? Okay, uh, I, I'm, I'm, I'm trying to read this myself to try to understand who, who, what the, the Azar is. <laughs> Meaning, physical presence now becomes an option. Uh, okay. Okay. Yeah. So basically, what 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 do you what do you mean, Taza? Because um, it really depends on your preference, right? Some, like I said, some people do want the physical. Uh, presence in the class but then again you know as i speak with uh, not just lecturers but also students some of them actually prefer to just you know carry on the way we are doing right now and just carry carry on uh, online so it really is very relative and it's really a person's preference you know if you say that the uh, physical class presence uh, increase is the value of the physical physical class presence is increased, to some people, not necessarily so. Because what I also uh, received as feedback last year um, from students was that they find that um, this, this on limited to uh, so the lecturers they can access the lecture if they because uh, right lecturers are just and so other you know two parts um and and the of um, not just Prof, I'm so sorry to interrupt, Prof. Uh, Prof, yeah. if you could kindly repeat um, maybe the last couple of seconds because oh, oh. I think it's breaking up a bit from your end. Okay. All right. So I was saying, um, you know, back to the comment about uh, the value of the physical class. What I got back from the students last year. Uh, not just students, but then from the lecturers, they they really value the online class because they, uh, it, you know, it, it allows them to be so much closer to the lecturers. That's what I was saying. Because the lecturers had provided them with so many different ways that they can be contacted. As, you know, as opposed to how it was before when they just met during the class. And, uh, you know, and maybe go to the office, you know, and maybe the, the lecturer is there, maybe not. But uh, what what the pandemic did was, and when we went uh, online, um, people were very open on um, communicating with uh, one another more closely. So students who were not, um, you know, didn't, didn't feel like they wanted to ask a question publicly, they can actually email, WhatsApp, you know, phone call, and you know some some lecturers are just so open to so many different ways that the students could uh, communicate with them and they could ask anything at any time and there were also students who previously were 
you know, a bit shy about speaking up in class. Suddenly online, they are like, you know, talking all the time. So it really is very relative and it really is, um, you know, uh, the individual preference or whether they, they want to be physically present or online. If I can just share a little bit of my own experience, Prof, I yeah. have indeed found that, um, you know, whether online or, or offline, uh, I noticed that students who tend to be shyer, they do tend to communicate more or they're more willing to communicate online by sending WhatsApp messages rather than raising their yeah. hand in yeah. class. Right, yeah. right. So, so the, the students also said that they were um, very, very appreciative of all the effort of the lecturers. They know that, you know, when we first started out, some lecturers were very, very unsure about how uh, to teach online and very, um, you know, they, they, they could feel the, the effort and the trouble that the lecturers go through in ensuring that the students, that they actually got uh, all that they're supposed to, <laughs> that all, all that they're supposed to get in class, you know, all the CLOs are achieved and all that. So they were very, very appreciative of the lecturers. Yeah, a lot of new things that we're learning. Um, Prof, uh, just to let you know, we've got, of course, you know, a couple of questions in the chat just now, but we also have questions coming in. Uh, I believe Umu and Linda, uh, or Umu actually just handed this to me. Now we've, got, we've also got questions coming in via a different platform. Okay. Uh, so I'm going to read up some of those questions right now. Um, the first question here, uh, going back uh, again to online teaching, is how does how will online teaching become a promising teaching mode for UM in the future? Probably a recap of everything that you said just now, yeah. Prof. Right. Do, yeah. But yeah, this is the way to go, isn't it? You know, the online teaching and uh, from from how what we had gone through. Well, if I if I can just you know bring up. Um, how it all started in 2016 was the time when uh, Prof Awang, at that time the TNCA had insisted that we go uh, we go on e-learning and you know how that had progressed from um, you know a week of e-learning for some faculties and then it went on to a week of uh, e-learning for other faculties and then the number of faculties grew you know uh, the the faculties that were um you know I, were asked or rather it was kind of like a top down i were instructed to you know to go on e-learning so people had e-learning week for a couple of years for a number of years really and then uh suddenly the haze came and then we just went 100 percent everybody was doing a everybody was asked on you know directed to go on e-learning for a whole week uh, during the during the haze, and that was not something that was planned. It, that was something that worked out as a business continuity management, you know, outcome. You know, because Prof Awan had started it in 2016, and people, you know, uh, had started doing it um, every semester. Every, uh, you know, everybody had had a, a turn on on doing it. Um, Obviously, you know, to be realistic, not everybody did it. You know, they knew that online learn, uh, they knew that e-learning week was coming up, so they made up for the classes ahead of time, or they just gave the students work. Like, hello, come on, you know, we're not all fools. But then we knew we knew that was happening. But at least the idea of e-learning, you know, was there already. And when we went through the haze uh, during. Uh, when, when we went through the haze, everybody had to go, you know, on e-learning, whether they liked it or not. And then the pandemic came. So when the pandemic came, you know, people, you know, just just had no choice. You know, we didn't know when it was going to end, right? It's, it's a year on and it still hasn't ended. And I think uh, Muhammad Shazril in the in the chat uh, says it all, you know, that that our online plat platforms have progressed a lot due to COVID-19. Kudos to uh, the ADEC team. Kudos also to PTM, you know, and, uh, you know, and, and, and uh, as I said earlier, uh, QMAC and, 
ASP Centre and AS, ASC that had put together papers very, very quickly to, you know, to ensure that Senate approves of all the initiatives that we are, we are undertaking in terms of alternative assessments, students being able to tarik diri from the semester based on the, you know, for medical reasons, so it will not be counted. Uh, students being able to apply for incomplete the I grade because they couldn't finish parts. Of, so all that was really everybody's work. Moving ahead, had, you know, taking advantage and, and moving ahead. This is exactly what we are going to do, the remote learning and the uh, ODL, you know, and, and who knows what else we're going to do to take advantage of, uh, you know, what we have learned, what we have learned, you know, really. Uh, through the experience. We've definitely learned a lot and come a long way. But Prof, if we can talk a little bit about the pain points, which were very painful 11 yeah. months ago yeah, uh, and yeah. are still a little bit painful still. Um, there is a question here that's come in. I will summarize it. Um, Dear Prof, <laughs> online teaching requires a lot of trust, especially in teaching and learning. You have to trust that behind the laptop or your phone is your student listening and learning. We have to trust that those assignments submitted by our students are genuine, despite Turnitin validation. We need to trust that the students, that they're actually learning, although they're silent. Um, and there are many other trust issues involved. And this lecturer says, sometimes as a lecturer myself, we do have this dilemma we are scared that the quality of our students are jeopardized because of online learning as we are learning at the same time on how to teach well using online methods and the question is <laughs> how can we <laughs> that was the preamble and the okay. question is how can we improve our trust issues with some methods that will not add extra burden on us especially to our friends who are having issues with online teaching um, and having to also have empathy for student problems. Internet credits not enough, family issues at home, natural disasters. Thank you, bro. May Allah bless you. <laughs> Thank you, Amin. <laughs> well, um, uh, do you know what the I in POIS stands for? I shall remain quiet because I'm suddenly integrity. <laughs> yeah, thank you, Dr. Azza. <laughs> Who was that? That's uh, our uh, lovely Dr. Azza. Dr. Azza. <laughs> okay. <laughs> yeah. There actually, this is a great platform to start testing people. On, you know, what's our mission? What's our vision? The VC just said it like two weeks ago. Well, anyway, the I, the in, uh, integrity. Basically, that's what we need to inculcate, right? Not just in our students, but also in our staff. Definitely is something that we are always wondering up, you know, about when we have our classes online, even as I have meetings online, you know, when people, you know, it's, it's quite practical for people to turn off their mic camera and their mics because you know otherwise they'll be echoing otherwise uh, you know it lags and so on and so forth so it's a convenient excuse so we don't know whether the person is actually there or not and students we we know that you know some students will probably fall asleep on their beds while they're while you're intensely you know <laughs> giving your lecture but basically is that uh, i think the other the other uh, uh, word that perhaps is not <laughs> included in, in our values is accountability. You just have to be accountable for yourself. You have to be accountable to, you know, uh, your own learning. That's why uh, even as we, we came on, well, I came on board and, you know, uh, in wanting to ensure that our students uh, uh, that we are able to inculcate certain values, the UMDNA uh, in our students. Accountability is one of them. They have to be accountable for their own learning. They have to be independent learners. And that's that's how they, when, when, we, when we incorporate independent learning in our curriculum, 
when we expect the students to be able to do independent learning, then they are accountable for their own learning. <clears throat> if they are not uh, independent learners, if they are expecting to be spoon fed all the time, how can they be accountable for their own learning? You know, so with that also comes integrity, right? So we have to be able to trust them in order in, in order for them to be accountable for their own learning. So if they are not um, trustworthy, you know, they're just going to lose out, lose out. And that's something that we have to get across. You know, this is you learning and this is you being accountable for your own learning. You know, and if you if you are not if you are not, you know, you don't have the integrity to do that. You know, that you, you don't we are not able to trust you that you will be, you know, accountable for your own learning. Then nobody else is is going to be doing the learning for you. I don't know if I'm making sense or not, but I'm just going about it in a, a very roundabout way. But I think one of the issues that many lecturers face uh, in, in online learning is the online assessments that we have to, that, that we make, uh, that we have to go through and the students have to go through. You want to have um, exams online. My biggest worry at that time was how are you going to ensure, you know, if you're going to have exams online, how are you going to ensure that the students are actually taking the exam? You know, so, you know, of course, there are there are gadgets and there are, you know, some some companies, some some companies that that people I know are employed at. Uh, they they have somehow they have this tool that if 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 you are not holding your mouse for a certain period of time, there would be an alert. You know, which means that you 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 are supposed to be at your desk working. So when you're at your desk working, you're you're holding your mouse the mouse all the time. You know, so if you are not holding the mouse for a period of time, then the alert comes up. To say that this person is not working, you know, and then if you're if you are working, yes, they've got some kind of app to ensure that, you know, your eyes are actually fixed on the monitor and and not looking elsewhere, and that is, you know, one of the proctoring device for exam examination taking, right? So, do we have to go through all that, you know, if we have, you know, built a society that you know, that has integrity, that you are able to trust, you know, then, you know, that's, that's perhaps one of the things that we uh, as a university need to work on. And that's why the values are there, you know, the values are there because uh, we think that we lack in this, you know. So these are these are the uh, values that we need to build, and these are the values that we need to develop: passion, oneness, integrity, sincerity, and empathy. Boys. So we know that we don't. If we don't have a hundred percent of these values in everybody, you know, staff, students. So that's what we need to work on. That's really what we need to work on. So moving forward, Prof, uh, we're doing we're going to be doing a lot of things using technology as we have the past year, but then we're also going to be humanizing it with um, our poise values. Would oh. that be? Yeah, that's a, that's a really great way of uh, looking at it. We're going we'll be using all this te technology. That's why. You know, I'll go back to my, you know, first, <laughs> Dr. Zahir has put points there. <laughs> she just wants to make sure I got it right. Um, going back to my point earlier, you know, we are all social animals, you know, whether we like it or not. Those who are the most reserved among us also, you know, they have to admit that, you know, this, this um, lockdown, the, 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 isolation and uh, all this 
staying at home it will get to us eventually you know so because we we really need to be with people and we need to teach our students that as well so we cannot be you know fully 100 percent just dependent on technology you know there has to be the social interaction that we have to also impart on our students what is good behavior what is unacceptable behavior and, and uh, you know all this comes with the you know physical presence you know they have on campus together with the rest of the campus community so that's that's something that personally i'm look, looking forward to Thank you, Prof, for sharing about that. Um, there are a couple of other questions which uh, I will just summarize. Uh, basically, there are people asking whether online teaching and learning is the way forward even after COVID-19, and you've already shared that indeed it is. Um, there are also questions about um, to what extent uh, this, you know, new normal uh, is here to stay and not coming back. And you've also just talked about how important it is that we hopefully be able to instill values in our students, whatever the new normal is, although we hope that we can actually get back together physically on campus again soon. Um, I'll go back now to some questions in the chat. Uh, going back to some technical matters, <laughs> there's one question here about the teaching burden for blended learning. And the question is, it's uh, from Dr. Zahir, actually. So Dr. Zahir would like to know, how do we acknowledge the work done by our academic designing and curating content for asynchronous learning? The current AK, Arahan Kurja form, only acknowledges face-to-face -face, um, teaching. Uh, that's incorporated in this year's KPI. So they get extra points. Uh, for being involved in the ODL micro credential as well as uh, uh, remote learning. Okay, and I guess the uh, documentation or the recording of this that will be taken care of um, as we go along. What do you mean, the recording? Uh, of this? Well, at the presently, we have an AK form that documents face-to-face uh, -face teaching. Uh, it's called the Borang Beban Tugas Pengajaran. Uh, and of course, that's a very old forum. Mm. So as you were saying, Prof, you know, it will be incorporated into the KPI, all of this curating content, designing asynchronous learning. So my guess is that as we go along the next few weeks or the next few months, um, there will be mechanisms for us to know how we will document this as evidence for our KPIs. Right. Right. Mm. Okay. Thank you, Prof. Um, now, we've got another question about supervision of master's and PhD students. The question is, can that be fully online now, including courses like research methodology courses that no longer have physical attendance requirements like before? OK, uh, I like the, the uh, Azar's questions because my answer is either yes or no. So this time it's yes. <laughs> Just to point out, those are questions coming from an engineer. <laughs> Dr. Azai is from the Faculty of Engineering. Yeah. Okay. Yes, you know, because we have, um, you know, we, we uh, some faculties have already started, uh, even before the pandemic, that their research methodology uh, course is conducted online. Okay. Okay, Prof, we'll move on to a question now from um, Dr. Bisha uh, from Faculty of Education all the way from science now to social science. Prof, will UM be coming up with bridging programs for individuals to join UM without the formal qualifications as currently required? Many want to come into UM, but do not have STPM or A-levels or diploma. Yes, uh, we actually brought, up, uh, brought that up as a point uh, of possibility. Uh, I think that is, um, I, I think that is a positive uh, move uh, forward, uh, but then we have not actually sat down to really work that out. But I hope that will be done, uh, you know, quite soon. So many initiatives, but that's, <laughs> that's one of those initiatives that we have not actually like sat down to, to work on. Prof, um, if I can ask a question about 
just a little bit running away from uh, what we're talking about now, online teaching and learning. You're saying that there's so many initiatives and indeed we can see, you know, with the new town halls coming up and so many uh, UM labs going on. Uh, there are a lot of new initiatives, a lot of new things that are going on. <laughs> just wondering, Prof, how do you yourself cope with the work? <laughs> That's so much work. Um, and I think I speak for everybody as well. But yeah, we'd like to know, Prof, how do you cope with the work? And what's your advice for all of us to cope with the work? Well, uh, I don't do it alone, Dr. Amira. I, I get a lot of support. I'm, I am, uh, you know, one of those who, you know, somehow I've been thrown into the lucky basket that, you know, gets a lot of support and help and uh, cooperation from so many people and so many PTJs that I'm so, so, you know, every, every day I go home and, you know, I wonder how I could have done it without this person, how I could have done it without that group of people, you know, like, there's no way I, I could have, uh, you know, whatever happened last year, there's no way I could have done it with just me and me alone or me and just one other person. There's a whole group of support that that I actually have around me and, and I'm fully, fully grateful for that. Yeah, so that's how I cope, you know. And I guess from, um, to bring it down to those who are lecturing, those who are supervising, I guess that is also a call for all of us to sort of like support one another and yeah. work together, right, as a team. Yeah, yeah. Right, right. You know, because um, we we hear this, you know, too often that people are working in silos, people are just, you know, just thinking of their own, you know, uh, their, their own interests, you know. And uh, I don't, I don't know if that is a hundred percent true all the time. It is true. It is true. But then it's not, it's not true of everybody in UM. You know. So yeah, that's that's really how I cope. Yeah, hope with. <laughs> it's so funny. I'm, I'm, I'm being so cliche and so corny now. You know, whatever it is, you know, you're, doing, you're, you're, you're working for an institution, right? You're working for an institution and, and you're working uh, for the sake of the students, right? You know, so. Yeah, I, I think Prav, that's something that many of us working in UM share this love for UM, the idea that we're part of this. Yeah. We're all really, very, really in, uh, we are. corny people. <laughs> <laughs> well, Prof, on that note, um, if you can be even cornier still, <laughs> what are your hopes and dreams for 2021 and beyond before we close off our chat? Oh, wow. 2021 and beyond. For everybody to be vaccinated. <laughs> as quickly as possible you know uh, yeah really I, I really really am looking forward to you know our at least some semblance of back to normal i know it's not possible for us to get back to normal but at least some semblance of it is something that i'm i'm looking forward to um maybe not in semester two uh but then maybe the late the later half of semester two, you know, and then for us to look forward to the convocation for last year to take place uh, middle of this year, I really would like to see those students walk uh, on stage uh, because it, it's something that's really missing, you know. I cannot <laughs> go on. <laughs> I'm not <sorry. laughs> So, Actually, yeah, the convocation is it's it's very touching, <laughs> the, yeah, the so ceremony. Much. Right. So, I am looking forward to that. Well, thank you so much, Prof, for sharing your dreams and hopes for that. I think we all share the same hopes as well. Thank you again, Prof, for spending your time to speak with now eighty of us, but previously it was over ninety of us here. Oh, and thank you. Really? Yes, <laughs> quite a lot of us. Yeah, <laughs> <laughs> okay. Um, 
Yeah, thank you so much to, to Prof and thank you to everybody. And um, just a plug in in case you might be interested, Prof, and also all of our audiences. We also have uh, happening in a couple of minutes, we are having a training session or a briefing session on using Cortex, which is uh, sort of like an ebook and online resources program that the university library is now um, trying to work out so that we can have integration of uh, online ebooks and online learning materials, I think, um, for us to use for our classes. So that's oh, on now. Yeah, very thank soon. You so much. Thank you. Right, right. Yeah. Okay, so okay. Thank you. Thank you, everyone, for staying. Uh, thank you for all the questions, and uh, thank you for, for being there. And thank you, ADEC, of course. <laughs> okay. Thank you, Prof. Bye, Amira. You said you wanted to take picture. Oh my goodness, thank you so much for the reminder. Yes, uh, very quickly, everybody, uh, two reminders. One, please fill up the feedback form available in the meeting chat. And two, everybody, please switch on your cameras and we will have a group photo. I'm going to need some help from uh, as many people as possible to please take a screenshot of the group photos and maybe you can then uh, send it to us here at ADEC. Well, I and also the ADEC team will try and take our screenshots as well. I'm just talking and talking, giving people a chance to fix their tudung and their hair uh, <laughs> and their background before they turn on their cameras. OK, so we've got a lot of cameras on now. So let's have a couple of series of group photos. I will um, let's have three series. Um, so I'm going to start the countdown now. Uh, so group photo series one. <laughs> Three, two, one, and smile. Click. I don't know whether you heard that from my computer. <laughs> so let's, um, I'm really hoping that I'm not getting just like the same one screen, but if everybody is also uh, taking screenshots, hopefully we'll get as many screens as possible. So now let's get ready for a second series of group photos. So again, <laughs> three, two, one, and smile. Okay. All right, that's our second series of group photos. And let's see um, if we can get a third one. And for the third one, let's all get ready. And three, two, one and poise. Okay, thank you so much, everybody. <laughs> nice. <laughs> All right. Thank you, Dr. Angela. Thank you, Prof. Camila. Bye. Bye, everyone. Thank you. Bye. 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 Thank you so much. Thank you.